I'm Tommy Matthews and I wanted to make this open space film to highlight the problem that us travelling show people have been getting depots, or what used to be called winter quarters. We need these places to rest and maintain our equipment. All my life I've been told to move on after the fair is close, just because I live in a trailer. Eight families brought this land, but the council refused to allow us to live on it. We can't get planning permission. Gypsies have sites made for them, but we're show people, and all we're asking for is the right to live on our own land, and this right is being denied to show people all over the country. Fair is to be yearly held and kept forever on the first day of St. Matthew the Apostle. I understand the attractions and amusement of the fair are greater than ever. After the cultural heritage of this country, and it should be looked at more seriously, but given more consideration. Our problems emanate from the fact that we live in a caravan. And everybody assumes that anybody that lives in a caravan, from whatever walk of life, is of some sort, is some sort of itinerant. It, it never was true, it still isn't true. The image that people have of us, which is fundamentally no different than, than anybody else. No other small business. Except we're a bit barmy. We, we decide to put it all on wheels. Stick a wheel at each corner and travel it. I mean, nobody in their right mind who's set up in a business really want to do a barmy thing like that. But it's in our blood, and that's part of our heritage. If they can dis discuss the, the ecology in such dramatic terms, in moving bypasses because they want the frogs to get to the pond so they can spawn. I don't think he's asking too much for the development proposal that Shomer should have consideration for a depot. And that's all I ask, is that we give him consideration. We need no subsidies, don't want any handouts. We just want the opportunity to, uh, to buy and settle, do what ordinary people do, and have the right to come home when we're ill, for education, for retirement, or when the rise wants services. I don't think it's asking too much. It really is only what everybody takes for granted. We've got one or two more on the road here already. We are a community on the move, used to hardship and adversity. We travel all over Britain and meet at different fairs, setting up our stalls and rides before dispersing again. The 1968 Caravan Sites Act provides legal stopping places for all travellers. But inside the 1968 Act, there was a clause which said that if you did provide the required number, you could get designation. And designation made it a criminal offence for any of these people to camp inside the area except on a licensed site. The definition had to exclude showmen and circuses when they were travelling, because otherwise you'd have got designation, you wouldn't have been able to set your fare up. And so you get this strange situation where the definition now states that whilst they're included, they're excluded when they're travelling together as such as part of an organised group. If you found an appropriate place in the Greenbelt, gypsies could actually have a camp there. When the showmen tried to do that, the council stepped in and said, no, showmen aren't included because you're excluded by that definition in the Act. The Showmen's Guild is regionalised. And in the London South East section, you've got just over a thousand members of the Guild. And yet at the present moment, you've got somewhere within the region of four to five hundred of those members have nowhere to stop legally. It's becoming difficult everywhere. Land is valuable. Old established sites are being squeezed. Families grow and they need to look elsewhere. Show people don't just move in on any piece of land they can find. Eight years ago, my friend Joe White bought an old circus site on the A50 road in Cheshire. Circus entertainers have lived there in their trailers since the war and he thought he would have no problem living there himself. The land when he brought it was ugly and derelict with the remains of an old brickworks and he spent a lot of time and money cleaning it up for his family to move on. When we come here, the, the children was, was babies. We, we attend the wakes here. We've had the three ch children christened here. And we needed a site. Um, I've got two rides which need full-time maintenance. Um, this was ideal. The school just down the road, shop. Uh, the water supply was on, the electric was on, uh, 
um, everything was going for it. Um, I, I, I fully b believe when I bought the site that I could just come on here and, and do as the circus did. But it didn't, it didn't go that way at all. I'd only been here 20 minutes and um, the council was down. Basically, Joe, the reason you're in the present position is because, as you recall, when you bought the land back in 1981, you bought a land that had been handled by circus families and been the base of the circus families going back right through into the last war. The trouble is there was very little proof. And the one thing you need in planning terms is proof. And the only thing you really had, of course, was this established use certificate, which was issued in 1971. And the established use certificate had the advantage of telling you that you could keep your equipment, you could keep your caravans on here, but it didn't say you could live in them. Now, when you bought the land, as you know, we made an application for an established use certificate for you. Yes, sir. What has come about as a result of that case is something much more worrying, and that is the fact that we found that the evidence that the council gave at that appeal was false. And in actual fact, I suppose the nicest way to put it is to say that it was edited. Mm -hmm. And somebody was being very sort of careful with the truth because certain documents weren't recorded and certain things that didn't really exist had only been threatened or put forward as formal documents. It's made me very unwell at times and uh, children get very unsettled because people say to them uh, where do you live and you can't live there any longer and I say to them tell them we can it's our home it's been a lot of worry it's been seven long years of anxiety worry sit up the eye please my mother is getting on now she's 75 coming up I don't suppose I could ever leave her on here on her own we need a place like this. If I take ill or, or anybody takes ill in the family, we've got to have somewhere to pull. If I have a mishap in the business or anything needs maintaining, anything needs repairing, we must have somewhere to pull. And there's not only me, there's so many other people in the same problem. And when you've got a site like this, you can come on, you, you've got the mains supply, you've got the water. You haven't, I mean, all my life I've knocked on doors and I've asked for a can of water. I've knocked on, knocked on doors and, and asked could I have uh, a power supply f for a weekend or whatever. But when you come on here, you don't need to do it. It's all your own. We had a house in Sandbach, and I spent all my childhood coming up and down from Sandbach to here to Brayton. And there was always been caravans. In fact, in 1940, Gandhi from a variety act started a circus. And he parked his wagons and trailers and caravans on this site. In fact, I've just got an old Sandbach Chronicle the old saying is, what can't speak can't lie, right? Sandbach Chronicle, Friday, December the 7th, 1951. And what have we got here in the middle? Brayton, home of a circus, and a picture of old Bob Gandhi with his horse Rex. And what's interesting reading here is, besides local sheep are in Panto, the sight of caravans, converted buses, and gaily painted lorries parked just off the busy A50 road near to the Sandbach is a familiar one these days for Brayton. It is one of the few villages which can claim to be the home of a circus. And where this brickworks used to stand here, where the old buildings used to stand, they'd be painting poles for the circus. They were all mucking in. Eugene Arco, the strongman, he stayed on here. There was an unbreakable ladder act. The Lorenzos had a buzz parked along by that edge across there and there's been caravans on this site, I would say, from the beginning of the 1940s. I can vouch for that. A friend of mine that's helping with this case, he, he, he phoned me up and asked me to go and see him. Uh, he told me a few things about the, the court and what the council had done. And when I got back here, my fingers started to tingle and I had to lay on this couch for two hours. I went to the doctor's the next day and uh, I had an ache and feeling sick and I told him, he said, well, I don't need to examine you, as I've already just said. He said, it's stress. And if, if that's what this is causing me, well, why? What is the difference than us living on it than a man with a house? The man wants to live there for 52 weeks of the year. The most we live there is 20. We may pull back there for an odd week in the summertime when we're closed or problems arise. But as long as you keep within the law, You've got a wall, a fence, an edge, or whatever it is, and the, the councils are happy with it. 
What is the difference? There is no difference to me than the man walking down the street. I'm as good as him, and he's as good as me. There's no difference. But there's that barrier between you. They just don't want you in the town. The wall's put up before you even get there. They just don't want you at all. motive is its fear, the fear that the settled community have always had traditionally of the outsider. That is, if you stop and think back, all your fairs, for example, were always held in what was known as the wasteland, that is the land outside of the village. They didn't encourage anybody to come in because they knew that the fair would attract peddlers and the jugglers and people. Everybody's over the house overlooking a park where a fair takes place always think they own the view. And nothing should interfere with that view because the fact that their house overlooks it, they think it's theirs. They move into somewhere where they've never lived and they try to mould that place. And they didn't know there was a fair. Came every year in that field or in that street. And so they get on every kind of committee they can think of and they try to mould it into what they thought it was going to be when they got there. Some of the showmen have been going there perhaps a whole around hundred years. And they've been there about three weeks. And then, you know, they try and tell you you shouldn't be there. The general public are of the opinion that when we pull on a summit, we do pull on there rent-free. Uh, we don't negotiate with councils or anyone else to pull on that site. They think we pull on there willy-nilly and that is the end of the story. 27's there. Can we go any further that way? They don't realise that there's perhaps 12 months planning goes into organising a fair. Uh, weeks before the fair arrives, as people come with tapes and measure it all up and make sure the certain rides will fit in certain places and certain positions. Um, make sure all the sites are allocate, allocated to the people that's been coming for generations. That's um, 22 there, now go back over there again. The majority of fairground sites that we use, there's no amenities really for us at all. There's no electricity supply laid on for the caravans, just for the domestic supplies, which obviously our women now have the same as everybody in the house. We've got hoovers and we've got refrigerators and we've got central heating and we've got all the amenities that everybody else has got. And really, you think that the council, when it is an established fairground site, which they know we're going to use for perhaps twice a year or once a year and pay a lot of money for, would provide a wholesome supply of water, an electricity supply, proper drainage and various things like that. It's not asking a lot, I don't think. When you think of the money that we are paying them, um, we don't seem to be getting anything for it. A lot of people don't realise that the um, showmen do so much for charity uh, and various handicap days which we organise during the season. Well, we have five or six hundred handicapped children in one day where we open the complete fair up, um, all free of charge. And I feel it's done throughout the country at all major fairs. And we operate the rides at a slower speed and the children's rides and perhaps give them a free candy floss and that type of thing. Most of us have been in the business for generations, and we all seem to be related. Even those few of us who do leave, like my cousin Frances, can't stay away for long. She's now a teacher, an historian, but the fairground and our family tradition and history remain very important to her. Aunt Lou was born on that site where she is. That's right. Um, I think it's, it's despicable what they're doing to them after all the years yeah. they've been there. Well, she's been there over 80 years. She was born on that site. Yeah. And the council are now putting pressure on them. That's right. And her family have been there oh, well over a hundred years. Yeah, I know. And they own it. I know. They've, well, they've always stayed there, haven't they? And Uncle Henry and Aunt Louis. And well. what would parents think of that, I wonder? <laughs> well, he wouldn't think a lot of it in the future, would he? No. Well, that's why it's what he's born to, and he realises it. But did I tell you the story about the other day when Phoebe, you know, cousin Phoebe, phoned me up, and she said, when people ask me, why we carry on with this way of life when it's so hard. I explain it like this. She said, I say, well, we are offspring of offspring of offspring. Mm -hmm. And it's just like the Prince of Wales. And if you were to say to, the, to Prince Charles, you're not going to be allowed to be king, he'd say, well, that's not right because that's what I've been born to. And she mm. said, that's exactly how we feel about our way of life. That's Prince of Wales yeah, and Lord of the Cells. Yeah. Looking casual in his lounge suit. And there he is, riding on 
Red Shirt Matthews roundabout, who was the brother of your great, great grandfather. And when they went to Sandhurst College, they built a lovely memorial chapel, and your great, great grandfather, his brother, gave a lot of money towards it. And that's what they're doing that day when the Prince of Wales is riding on it. Somewhere there, on the engine, there's a picture of Queen Victoria. And she's supposed to have had a ride on that, that roundabout. In fact, nearly every member of the royal family, apart from, I think it was Queen Alexandra, rode on that roundabout. Oh, it is. That's Red Shirt Matthews, he was the owner of that roundabout. And that's an interesting picture. Now, can you, you see what it says on that notice? That's a whole road and it's named after your family. That's Matthews Close in Farnborough. And your family were living there, ooh, 150 years ago? have always been associated with the fairground, certainly as far back as I've traced, which is back to 1755 when Anne Matthews, a traveller, came to Ditchling Church with her baby to be christened. That's 230 years. I think <coughs> they've always been travelling to the same fairs because there's such a continuity in the tradition. How would you like to cook your dinner like that? They were the good old days. Really? I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> Tewkesbury Mock has been going on for many years. The charter was granted in the 12th century. Many of the families that are actually attending this year's mock have been coming here for many generations. And in fact, their forefathers attended Tewkesbury with horse and carts, then went through the age of steam. They're still on the road. I wonder how many businesses actually in the country can relate to us. The showmen do need recognition, insomuch as that we are part of the British heritage. We are the oldest form of entertainment. If one goes back to the, you know, to the start of the, the mop itself, Although it was originally a hiring mop, amusements have been here for many hundreds of years. Ladies and gentlemen, pray silence for the mayor of the borough of Tewkesbury, Councillor Peter Apple, who will officially open the Tewkesbury Mock Fair, 1988. Uh, Peter, if I could at this stage, I now would like to present you with a cheque from the Showman's Guild, which will go towards your charity funds and it's for a, a, a grand figure of £3,393. We don't want any winter quarters given to us. We're quite prepared to buy our own pieces of land and, and also to do anything that the local authorities want. We need recognition and our members do need help. I lived at uh, my husband's family site. It's been in the family over 100 years. Unfortunately, we've outgrown it. Um, because the families got bigger and bigger and the extensive equipment that we have to have and maintenance, etc., simply wasn't enough room. We found ourselves that we had to buy somewhere else. So here we are, we had the opportunity of buying this place and had to take the chance um, that we would get it passed. We've been here coming up for the ninth winter. This will be the ninth winter this coming winter now. And we've been through the normal ropes, um, lots and lots of pressure. Uh, we've done everything by the book, we've got a terrific amount of local support but unfortunately we lost our appeal to the High Court in uh, the end of June this year. We're hoping to maybe be able to go to the House of Lords um, but we're very, we're very worried because you know if we do happen to lose or if we don't get to the House of Lords we've only got 16 months to vacate the site in which case we simply don't know where we're going to be. I've had a whole stack of letters from all over the country of uh, show people who uh, are not able to stay on permanent sites. It is a real problem in this country. These people are small businessmen, they're entrepreneurs, they're, they're not gypsies in that sense of the word. They have to travel uh, from show fairground to fairground during the summer and then they have to have somewhere in the winter where they can put their equipment which has to be of course maintained
this doesn't uh, happen anywhere else in Europe. I mean, it's taken for granted that they can have permanent sites. Children need to go to school. The old folks need to have a permanent place. Why do we treat them as kind of outcasts? The Showman's Guild of Great Britain has very strict rules and criteria in the way that the, uh, not only the fairgrounds are run, but also the sites themselves, the winter quarter sites themselves are run. Uh, also, they are very much part of the community in my constituency, although they're away touring in the summer, when they come back to the winter quarters, they are accepted into the community, they play a very important part in the community. So I felt that they had a very strong case to make. Well, they've got to be given at least the same rights that, in theory, travellers have. Uh, travellers have certain rights, they're not always carried out, but at least in principle, in theory, they have them, that they have to be provided with sites. Now, it must be the same for shore people. They give an enormous amount of pleasure to people, and I think the government's got to take some action and introduce laws that would make local authorities provide them with decent sites. We get lots of sympathy from those who know us, our guild and even members of parliament but it seems that no one will do anything for us and we have to do everything ourselves. I wrote to a third of the councils of this country. I drew a line across the map and I just sent, it must have been anything up to 40 letters to main councils asking if there was any possibility at all of land available for travelling showmen. And not one answer came back with a yes. I also wrote, within a 50 mile radius of this area, to land agents, um, anyone, to see if there was land available for our use, and again the same thing, no. Last week I was called in, a new compulsory purchase order served on a family that's had a land since before the last war. It's needed for a feeder road to a roundabout system. And as a result, they're going to lose their homes. All right, they're going to be compensated. They're going to be paid out on today's value, which sounds a very good thing. Except for the fact that there is no other piece of land in that county that they can get planning permission on. Matthews is the same. He went to a piece of land which has absolutely no value whatsoever, extremely well hidden, um, perfectly safe access, could cause no harm to anybody. I mean, say, if you're ever going to find an ideal site anywhere in the countryside, forget about your green belt, he's found it. He's within easy striking distance of shops, schools, everything else. And yet, even in the height of winter, I defy you to find the site unless you drive half a mile up the driveway and go in and look at it. We was looking for approximately 10 years to find somewhere to stop. There was about eight, eight families of us actually, with nowhere to go. And if we didn't find somewhere, it meant we'd probably have to end up on a lay-by somewhere. And I went to the neighbouring councils all around this area, and every one of the councils all told us the same thing. We've got nowhere suitable. You're not our responsibility. So in the end, it just come to the crunch that we either had to buy this place or stay on the side of the road. So we had no choice in the end. They state that it's Greenbelt land. But before we bought the land, we had a search on the land, and it stated in the search that the um, use to the land was white land. Now, the term of white land means it's undesignated. So, and also what came out in the search, it had a special concession in it for travelling showmen and the use of their business, which I thought meant quite a deal, but apparently they tell me that means nothing. And they're on land that we used to rent at one time. We used to grow cereals. We stopped growing cereals there because it wasn't profitable. We can't put stock on there because of the worry from trespass and vandalism. And it's green belt, can't be built on. If it's left, it'll go derelict and be an absolute eyesore to everybody. And I think it's a very good use for this part of the green belt because it's, it may as well be used for a good purpose. All of us here are in debt for this land which we had to buy. For example, we had to take a mortgage out on the land, and, and whilst doing that, not really being 100% sure that we could stay here. Can you imagine buying an house and taking a mortgage out and not knowing whether you could live in it? I mean, that's the same thing for us. We, we had to do this because we had nowhere else to go.
All you need is a ministerial circular. They've had several already, but they just need one. And all it needs to do is contain one sentence. And that is that showmen and circuses are included in the definition of need for gypsy sites whilst, whilst in winter quarters. Nothing else. Simple sentence like that would give them exactly the same rights that applies to gypsy sites and therefore in the right cases they would be an exception to Greenbelt or other restrictive planning policies. At the moment I'm in a bit of a, of a predicament because my husband doesn't suffer good health. I mean he's been told that he could be in a wheelchair within five years. Well I've got to think of that. Where am I going to go? I mean, I've been married 33 years and most of that time we've been on laybys and pushed on, you know, in the middle of the winter, get off of here and get off of there. You know, it makes me very angry to think that in the Second World War we were allowed then to stop in green fields. I can remember stopping in farmers' fields. Oh yeah, pull your loads in there while your boys go to war. My grandfather, my father's father, he fought in Flanders. He was gassed, sent home gassed from Flanders. I mean, uh, nobody said then you can't stop in green fields. They were only too pleased, weren't they? Well, it could possibly be the end of first, as we know them today. I think they perhaps would like to see us all settled down in um, amusement parks and uh, theme parks, that sort of thing. Well, I think that's one of the excitements for the local children when they see the caravans and the trailers and the lorries come along. I mean, whenever we go to a town, the children always wave. Even some of the grown-ups come to that. They just want to close the cupboard and hope we vanish, which we're unable to do that.